Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you for being here. You know, my grandfather used to say, success is a proud father and failures are lonely often. You've made me feel like such a proud father today, and, and thank you. It is very surreal for me to be here. I started my tour at the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. And I must apologize, they gave me a copy of the letter that I wrote the president when I was 10 years old. And I left it in the hotel room. <laughs> but I could tell you how the story started. First thing, so many people presume that I must have come from a social family, a political family. My grandparents were immigrants and they came from Europe with a pair of candlesticks. My mother was very proud to say when she was growing up, she didn't even have a bathroom inside the house. She became a successful woman. She was a pilot in World War II. And I just wanted to uh, state that because, again, people think that I had family connections. I was 10 years old, and since my mother was a pilot and I couldn't play sports, I had chronic bronchitis and asthma. So she used to take me to the airport to look at the planes take off. Well, we were at LaGuardia Airport on October 12th, 1958 and they said President Eisenhower was arriving. And I told my mother I wanted to meet him. Well, my mother was a cross between Amelia Earhart and Auntie Mame. She didn't say, <laughs> don't be silly, you're 10 years old, the president's not gonna wanna meet you. Well, they told us where he was coming in. Mind you, this was pre-Kennedy assassination. You said, where's the president? They weren't talking into walkie-talkies and their eardrums. So I went up to the president and I saluted him, and he saluted me back. Then I looked up at Mrs. Eisenhower, and I used the same line in her that I used on my aunts and my grandmother, and I said, you are so beautiful. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> she kneeled down, and she gave me a kiss. I didn't know about Mamie Eisenhower bangs and anything. I just knew she was the wife of the president. She asked me if I'd ever been to Washington, and I told her my uncle had moved to Bethesda. She said, would you like to come visit the general and myself? I said, I would love to. Well, then I guess my mother exchanged grown-up information with the aides and her secretary. And came Easter, we went off to the White House. Well, we had milk and cookies with Mrs. Eisenhower. And then she said, would you like to go say hello to the general? I said, I would love to. We went into his office. What was the first thing I did? Sat down at his desk. Then I was sharpening his pencils. Then I turned around and he had a calendar behind him. I figured, I've got to circle my birthday. <laughs> my birthday was already circled. My birthday is June 14th, which is Flag Day. <laughs> but I figured, I'll double. I wrote Barry's birthday. <laughs> Suddenly the president came in and he was wearing golf cleats. And I said, Mr. President, I remember my mother was always yelling at my father about wearing golf cleats in the house. Can you hear me back there? Yes. So I said, Mr. President, you're scratching the floor. Well, he wanted to change the subject. He said, how would you like to go say hello to my dog? He had a Weimaraner named Heidi. They would have given me the tie. <laughs> so we went out to the, the South Lawn and we played and rolled around. That was myself, the president didn't roll around. We went back into the Oval Office and we took pictures. Three months later, my birthday, what do I get in the, in the mail? A square of the Oval Office floor with the golf cleat marks. <laughs> and that was really the start of my, was somebody applauding there for my collection? <laughs> so that was the start of my collection as a child at 10 years old. And the funny thing is, is I, I apologize, I wish I had the letter, but could you imagine the, the precociousness of a 10 year old boy? I started a diary that day and then I wrote him and people said, why didn't you have a copy of the letter? When you're 10 years old, 1958, they don't have computers. They don't have copy machines. I mean, I think they had mimeograph, but I was 10 years old. And I, not only did I send him a letter, but he sent him a picture of my dachshund and myself. I figured he had to have one. Moving along, I went off to camp, and my bunk mate was a young man named James Lee Ochengloss, whose sister was Jacqueline Kennedy. So, you know, I, I wanted to give you my background, because to show you the path to the White House. Well, when my parents were slugging it out in a divorce, Jamie used to invite me to the White House to bunk there, and we used to have fun. Um, how old was I? Let's see, 1961, I, was, I guess I was 13 years old. 
Well, we did things that kids used to do. We used to put powder on the president's pillow so he'd think he's getting gray. We put soap suds in the White House pool because we didn't want to take a bath. Well, through the Kennedys, I met the Johnsons. And uh, in fact, I was dating Lucy Bird, Lucy Baines Johnson. And the Johnsons were teenagers, and as girls are, they kept writing and saying, Barry, Linda has a crush on this one, and Lucy has a crush on that one. Well, I love pleasing people, and I like making dreams come true. So you remember George Hamilton? So I fixed up Linda with George Hamilton, and Lucy and I and the four of us went off to the Academy Awards. Well, I got mononucleosis. For, is there any members of the press here? No? Good. Anyway, I got mono, and I had to drop out of college. So Lucy got me a job working for her daddy, Lyndon Baines Johnson. I was getting $100 a week, and I was called an LBJ bipartisan intern. And I was supposed to be using the mimeograph machine and answering the phones, but forget that. So Lady Bird uh, said to Lucy and I, she said, what could we do? What could Lyndon and I do that's different from the Kennedys? They had the ballet, they had the Shakespeare. Well, my father had a theater ticket agency. So I, I used to go to all the Broadway shows. I said, why don't we start putting on Broadway shows at the White House? Well, they loved it. You know, people don't stop to realize that, that now they have Air Force One and heads of state come in and come and go on jets. But it really wasn't until the Eisenhower administration that heads of state started coming visiting Washington. People just didn't travel like that. So come the Johnson administration, they were coming and going. So I said, let's put on Broadway shows. They didn't even have a stage at the White House. So I called two friends of mine, a woman named Rebecca Harkness and a woman named Alice Tully, and we got a stage for the White House. And I would call up people like David Merrick and Mike Nichols and Alexander Cohn, and we started putting on shows like Hello, Dolly, and Bye Bye, Birdie. And that had never been done. And I wasn't looking to become a senator, a congressman, an ambassador. I just wanted to be part of the action and part of history. I didn't have an agenda. That used to really upset some people because they couldn't figure out what does Barry want. I was just so happy to be working for the President of the United States. And, you know, backing up a little bit, when you're a sickly kid, um, I related to Theodore Roosevelt because he had asthma, he had bronchitis. So when you can't run like the other boys are doing, you kind of feel like you're a second class citizen. So when you have the President of the United States telling you're a great guy, you're in all your glory. So let's see, that was the Johnson years. And then Nixon uh, lived next door to my mother in New York City after he lost the gubernatorial race. And my mother was always working it for me, and she told her about me. And I used to go off to a restaurant and to the movies with Richard Nixon. Skip is staring at me saying, I never knew all these stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just fascinated with the presidency. I don't know how it started. And is my mic OK? Yeah? Um, I loved history, and I, I can't say I got it from my father or my grandfather, but so I, I guess meeting Eisenhower that day, and I was a voracious reader, I just always wanted to read. Um, and I, I guess you know, I also used to ask my mother about our family history, and she knew very little, because all the wreckage used to be burned when, when they were leaving one town after another in, in Europe. So here was Richard Nixon, and you know, for all his complexities, and, and he was a brilliant, brilliant man. And um, he used to tell me, he used to talk to me like I was an adult. Well, when Nixon won the presidency, uh, he and Mrs. Nixon brought me in to coordinate youth concerts at the White House. And um, one of the events that I was most proud of doing, I coordinated a state dinner for the Apollo 11 astronauts at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles. And they really didn't used to have state dinners outside of the White House. Well, one of the attendees was a man named Charles Lindbergh. Well, President Nixon wanted Mr. Lindbergh's autograph. The astronauts wanted Lindbergh's. Lindbergh's want, Lindbergh wanted the astronauts. So I grabbed four menus, had them all sign them, and one went into my pocket. So I had great fun during the Nixon years. Then President Mrs. Ford came in. Well, there's a story I'm going to tell, especially since Skip is here. It was the Shah of Iran's 50th birthday party, and I was invited to the Iranian embassy. Well, the ambassador's dog went by. And I barked. Now you might find that implausible. Why is a <laughs> guest barking at the ambassador's dog? But if anyone who knows me, I love dogs. Suddenly, a man named Steve Bull, President Ford's aide, who had also worked for Mr. President Nixon, came up and said, Barry, the president would like to talk to you. 
I went up, I said, yes, sir. He said, Barry, were you barking again? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, well, the Shah would like to talk to you. Well, mind you, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20s. So the Shah says, Mr. Landau? I said, yes. He says, I understand you're responsible for a lot of the movie stars here today. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, the, my wife and I are giving a New Year's Eve party, and we'd like to invite them. He said, I will put as many jets as you need at your disposal. Can you imagine inviting people to go to Persia for New Year's Eve with the Shah of Iran? So that's what I did. We came back. I had two jets, by the way. We came back, and there was a message. I was living at the Watergate, at a little studio apartment. And um, there was a message there at the reception saying, Mrs. Ford called. Well, the shy, precocious kid that I was, I called Ann Ford, Mrs. Henry Ford. She says, Barry, I didn't call you. And then Mrs. Ford called back, uh, her secretary, and she said, Jerry and I would like to know if you would like to work during the bicentennial. I said, I'd love to. My salary, I think, went up to $200. So, you know, it wasn't very much, but I would have done it all for nothing. So during the bicentennial, I became the assistant chief of protocol. And basically, I arranged the entertainment. I worked with the um, corresponding State Departments. And my two assignments were the Emperor Hirohito of Japan and the Empress and uh, Queen Elizabeth. And again, it may sound strange. I mean, who is Barry Landau? Um, I had met the Emperor of Japan when he was in New York with his wife. And all the Emperor wanted to do was meet movie stars and have his picture taken. You know, people always think of you the Emperor of Japan or, or the Queen of England or the President of the United States that you don't, that you're different. They're the same. So I had met the Emperor before and the Queen I had met in the 60s. And I was in England, let's just jump back 10 years. So when Mrs. Ford said, would you like to work on the Queen's visit? I said, I had met the Queen. Well, in, in the 1960s, I went to England for a film premiere. And when I met the Queen, I said, I'd love to meet your dogs. <laughs> She arranged it. The next day, I went off to Balmoral Castle and played with her corgis. Anyway, so during the Ford administration, I had this august title and put on my white tie and tails, and I was assistant chief of protocol, and I had great fun. And then the Carters came in, and um, I worked for them for three months, but I think I was a little too much for the Carters. You know, the president liked his cardigan sweaters, and he didn't want ruffles and flourishes, and I like ruffles and flourishes played three times. So I came back to New York City and I started a special events firm and marketing firm. Then President Mrs. Reagan came in. Well, one of my godfathers was a man named Jimmy Stewart. And Uncle Jimmy knew President Reagan and they were roommates years ago, so that's how I knew the Reagans. So they brought me back as a consultant, but I was getting more than $200 a week. But I have to tell you a fun story about uh, President Mrs. Reagan. Does anyone here old enough to remember Patricia Neal? Yes? Well, January 20, you don't look like you're old enough to remember, but you are. Well, it was Pat Neal's birthday, January 20th, 1985. And that was the coldest inaugural in history, even colder than President Grant's in 1873. So the inaugural parade was canceled. And it's Pat's 60th birthday. So I gave her a luncheon at the Watergate. And who came? Frank Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, Charlton Heston. Um, Dean Martin, Don Rickles, Robert Wagner, um, Merv Griffin. Well, one of the guests was Rich Little. Do you remember Rich Little, the Impressionist? So he turns to Pat and he says, Pat, out of all your famous friends, who do you wish was here? She says, oh, dear Betty Davis. I said, let's go up and call her. We make a crank call. We go up to the room, 203-226-3804, which was her number in Westport. By the way, Betty Davis had gone on record. She was an arch Democrat, and she said if Ronnie Reagan ever got elected, she'd leave the country. <laughs> I said, Bet, it's Barry. Oh, sweetheart, you're so nice to call you there with all your rich Republican friends. She says, Who are you with? I said, By sitting next to me is Jimmy Stewart, who was really Rich Little. So Rich gets on the phone. He says, Bet, it's Jimmy. Oh, how are you? How's Gloria? When are we going to do another film together? You're so sweet. How's that bum Ronnie Reagan? Finally, he says, Miss Davis, I only think it's fair to tell you this is not Jimmy Stewart. This is Rich Little. Who? Put Barry on the phone. I get on the phone. You son of a... Curses me out and she hangs up. We were really feeling in our cups when we went to the White House and who's talking to the president? 
President Reagan, but Uncle Jimmy Stewart. So we went up very proud of our prank call to Betty Davis. Jimmy says, that was so mean of you to do it to that nice lady. I said, come on, Jimmy. He says, Barry, give me the number, I must apologize. 203-226-3804. Reagan says, Jimmy, I will call her. Let me straighten it out, you know? So we go to the usher's office, 203-226-3804. Bet it's Ron Reagan. She says, F you, and she hangs up. <laughs> so I had great fun during the Reagan years. Am I okay? Okay, good. Let's see, people like hearing anecdotes. It was two, one, oh, I have great Clinton stories too, but this is one of my favorite ones during the um, Bush years. Lech Walensko, Poland was visiting, and a member of his delegation, I've got to watch myself with the first lady here. So, um, two members of his delegation put their butts, derrieres, down on the state dining table that had been there for over 100 years. The table collapsed. It was, they never repaired it. They now have a new table. All the china, all the crystal, everything fell to the floor. Well, did you ever see somebody have an accident? You're not supposed to be laughing, but you laugh. So Barbara Bush, his first lady, she starts laughing, and I'm laughing because she's laughing. So we start hitting each other. She says, Barry, stop. I said, you stop. She says, I said, what are you laughing at? She says, well, Barry, they're just going to blame us, uh, the dumb Polacks, instead of us fat-ass Texans. <laughs> President Mrs. Uh, Clinton. I met President Mrs. Clinton through an old friend of mine named Pamela Harriman. And she said, I want you to meet this couple. And he's a comma. And he's going to be President of the United States. And that's how I met Governor and Mrs. Clinton. And my job is, my name was kind of passed around if they needed a, a movie star in some state or some rally to do a public service announcement, they would call me. I was the go-to guy. And um, I guess the first person I met with was James Carville. Um, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. But I have a couple of funny stories to tell you about President Mrs. Clinton. Um, I was always trying to keep a low profile because I didn't really have an official title. and. Um, a friend of mine was uh, one of President Clinton's uh, trip directors, and uh, I've regards from Kirk Hanlon. <laughs> and um, one day they were having a fundraiser in New York City, and it was a, uh, an event where they went to see the Lion King. So everyone kept calling me to get tickets. Well, finally, uh, Christy Brinkley and Aretha Franklin called. So I called the First Lady's office and I said, what do I do? And they said, you gotta keep a low profile. I just can't keep adding all these stars. So they said, we'll arrange you to have tickets, but they'll just be under your name, but keep a low profile. I said, okay, okay. So they were having a, a reception at the Supper Club on 47th Street before everybody went off to the theater. And I was told where to stand. And again, keep a low profile. Well, we met the president and first lady and took pictures and they had a pool photographer. The next day, above the fold in the New York Times is a picture of Christie, myself, and Aretha. So much for my low profile. Another time in Los Angeles there was a fundraiser and I was sitting at like six o'clock at the table and there was a lady missing at 12 o'clock and who was sitting on my left? I can't remember at the moment. But one of the protesters came in, and she had bought that ticket at 12 o'clock. And um, again, talking about the table. So suddenly she picked up a butter knife, and she started protesting and heckling President Clinton when he was speaking. So they said, get rid of the dang, get rid of her. So I went up to her in my tuxedo. I said, ma'am, you're going to have to come with me. Well, she hauls off and belts me. The, meet, the entire presidential press rise had turned around, all 200 members, and I'm dragging her out. Well, what do you think happened? She had a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> and the next day, above the fold of the Los Angeles Times, is myself with my date. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody kept saying, Barry, you know, we know you, you want to find somebody new, but the extent that you would go to. 
And there was one other time, it's amazing how, how me and my, my keeping my low profile got myself into trouble. Um, it was on the, uh, the eclipse of the White House, and they were lighting the White House Christmas tree. And I was holding the seat for my friend Kirk's wife at the time. And then suddenly a member of the First Lady's staff came out, and they said, we really need to use that seat. Do you mind? I said, of course not. And they brought out these two cute little kids. And I think the president had met them in, I'm looking over here, in Ireland, the two little kids that gave them the, right? Well, when the president came out on stage, you know, he kind of motioned me to hand it to them. Sure enough, as I'm handing them the kids, the next day of the wash. Let me tell you a little bit about my collection. My collection started when I was 10 years old uh, with that flaw. But I was at a party in New York City. Does anyone remember Truman Capote? Well, I was at the black and white ball, and I was dancing the frug, which I don't know if any of you, again, old enough to remember. Do you remember the frug? You do? OK. And somebody pokes me, and I turned around, and I just see what I thought was a little old lady. I went back to doing the frug. I was actually dancing with a beautiful woman named Shireen. And again, I felt a poke. So I turned around. She said, what makes you think it wasn't me? I said, obviously an oversight. She said, is your dance card filled? Nope, pretended I erased it. So she and I are dancing. We're surrounded by photographers. I said, what is your name? You gotta come clean. She said, you can call me mean old Mrs. L. I said, well, you can call me mean Mr. L. More and more photographers, television cameras. I said, you gotta tell me who you are. She said, my name is Alice Roosevelt Longworth. Well, again, I was around 14, 15, maybe 16, the oldest. She said, well, I run a firehouse on Massachusetts Avenue, and if ever you come to Washington, you could bunk with me. Well, I was coming down to Washington, and how do you think she met me at National Airport? In a fire truck. <laughs> so she and I went roaming. We, we were great friends. You want some water? You okay? Would you like some water? Okay. So we were in a bookstore called the Francis Scott Key Bookstore, and I was looking through a bin of papers, and I came across a menu from Rutherford B. Hayes when they were visiting Lexington, Kentucky in 1878. And I said to Alice, I said, I gotta call a friend of mine, she, he collects them. She said, the hell with your friends, you should be the collector. And I have a lot of daddy stuff, of course daddy was Theodore Roosevelt. And she said, you should be the collector. So in earnest, my collection started that day with, at the Francis Scott Key Bookstore in Georgetown with Alice Longworth. I used to put ads in newspapers for former members of cabinet, senators, children, grandchildren. You know, when I was collecting, they didn't have eBay. Um, my collection came out of scrapbooks. You know, today people have emails, but years ago, in my grandparents' generation, people pasted down the memories of their lives. Um, they weren't meant to be uh, go into a book. They really weren't even meant to be seen by other people. Um, three of my favorite, I brought a couple things to show you. Three of my favorite menus. One was a, a luncheon in Pasadena given for President Taft. And the lady, and this came out of her scrapbook, she wrote, what do you know? The president ate the decorative strawberries off the dais while the benediction was being given. <laughs> she didn't mean for Barry Landa to put it into his book. But these were just to jog their memories for future generations. Um, I was at a flea market a few years ago, and there was a suitcase that I bought, and it belonged to Ann Lincoln, who was the Kennedy housekeeper. And what happened is when, when she died, her children or grandchildren didn't pay the storage bills. So it wound up at auction, and the guy at the flea market sold it to me. Well, inside were all these memos and menus, and um, on the back of one of the letters, the White House chef at the time had written that his, he was afraid his wife was having an affair with one of the stewards, so he wanted to be on to the same shift. Well, Jackie sent it along to the president, and the president on the back of it wrote a little ditty about the difference between Republicans and Democrats. He said, Jackie, you know why there are more Democrats than Republicans? He said, Republican boys are going to marry Republican girls, but they want to have a little fun first. So they date Democratic girls. Republicans sleep in separate rooms. Some even sleep in separate beds. That's why they're more Democrats. Well, President Kennedy never intended me to repeating at the Clinton School of Public Service. <laughs> There's another one. Um, 
Theodore Roosevelt was running for re-election uh, against his successor, William Howard Taft, and it was a luncheon that the mayor of New York gave. Have you ever sat at a party, a wedding, or anywhere where you wrote little notes on the menu and passed it around? Yes? Maybe? <laughs> well, this was between Theodore Roosevelt, who was now called Colonel Roosevelt, he had already been president, Archie Butt, his military aide, who was now working for President Taft, and John Jacob Astor. And they just agreed to meet again in New York City in two months' time. But two months later, John Jacob Astor and Archie Butt went down on the Titanic. So what I love about my collection is that it's unvarnished, unchoreographed, it's unscripted. It wasn't meant to be uh, a diary. You know, only two presidents kept a diary, Rutherford B. Hayes, a formal diary, and Ronald Reagan. You know, now in the White House, in the um, old executive office building, they have a diarist that records all this. But years ago, they didn't. And really, until the National Archives that runs all these presidential libraries, presidents did what they wanted to do with their papers. So getting back to when I was a little boy, I put up a map in my room saying, where is the president? And if I had a menu from, say, Woodrow Wilson in 1916, say, May 10th in Chicago, and I had another one from Milwaukee for May 17th, I had to know where the president was those other days. I had to have every menu, every luncheon menu. And my, my dear friend, Arthur Schlesinger, who's, who's passed on, he said, Barry, you don't realize what you've created. And I said, no, Arthur, I don't. He said, you're providing the missing links to presidential history. Well, when Arthur Schlesinger speaks, you pay attention. I didn't realize that I was just a compulsive collector. People always ask me, um, are you still collecting? Um, what are you looking for? I just came from St. Louis, and I met the granddaughter, no, the daughter, of Joseph Pulitzer. And she gave me some menus. Actually, I brought one or two of them to show you. But, you know, I had some of the menus, but what she had that I didn't have, she had like the little coat check or the little enclosures. You know, when you go to a wedding or a party, you get all these enclosures. Well, a collector has to have everything. So I'm going to take a minute, if I may, and I'll show, yes, is that okay? Good. Can you all see, can you all see this? This is a menu from 1902, when Theodore Roosevelt was visiting St. Louis. Just look at the detail. That's the presidential flag at the time. And I apologize, you know, what I'd like to do is come back and bring maybe 100 of my menus and put them on exhibit here at the school and show them to you. Um, but on the back of this teepee here, there's a little enclosure card. And basically it says, you know, the president is gonna be giving a speech, please do not go up to him, do not ask for autographs. But you know, some people have the card, the menu, but they don't have the little card. And then in my briefcase, she also gave me the RSVP cards, the photography card, the ticket to get on the ship, it was called the Mark Twain to accompany the president. So you know, a collector is never ending, you never know what you, what you don't have. Um, a man came up to me a few months ago and he said, I have something for you. Well, he got my attention. He had a ticket that Lincoln used to commute from Springfield, Illinois to Chicago when he was the attorney for the company. He said, I don't want to sell it, but I'll trade you. I had to come up with something pretty darn good. So I had a signed ticket from Charles Lindbergh from the, the kidnapping trial. And Mrs. Lindbergh had given it to me, so I traded I feel I got the better end of it. But did you ever take a commuter railroad that has all the punch marks? Well, President Lincoln used this. And you know, what I enjoy about my collection is that they're not these august um, treaties and, and letters and things. It's, it's bits of ephemera that was supposed to be thrown away. And thank goodness that there were generations of, of our grandparents and great-grandparents that pasted down these, these memories. Um, so thanks to Mr. Schlesinger, who's mentored me and taught me so much about what I was doing. Um, thinking, I told you a little bit about myself, my collection. Um, how did the book come about? Uh, the Washington Post did a little story on me, which wasn't little at all, and it said, New York man collection rivals the Smithsonian. Well, I used to be able to be a bit of a scoundrel and go up to people and say, oh, what is that? And I knew very well what it was. But now, they, since that article, uh, Reuben Murdoch uh, is a friend of mine, he called me up and said, Barry, I didn't know you had such a collection. 
He said, I just bought HarperCollins, and I'd love for you to do a book on the collection. I said, okay. So they asked me to do three books on different aspects of my collection. And that brought me to you here today. It is, you know, President Clinton is a great collector. In fact, I used to have to agree to his advanced people and his trip organizers never to show the president things because as soon as he would see me somewhere, he would look in my pocket like, what does Barry have in his pocket? And of course, he'd be late. <laughs> so it is kind of surreal for me to be standing here today. It's, it's, it's such an honor. And I'm going to be 60 on my next birthday. And for me to pass on to, to, to the future generations, uh, now I've got to find a home for my collection because I want other people to learn from it. Um, so I'm going to throw it out to questions and to Skip. And thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. Questions? No questions. First lady has one. I'd just like to know where you house all of this collection. <laughs> and is it where anyone could come and see it? Unfortunately not. Most of it's in storage in Washington and parts of it in New York. I, I just have like the items out that I'm writing book two. Um, right now, I'm, you know, I'm leaning towards, different people wanted different things to happen to it. Um, Merv Griffin wanted to buy and give it to the Reagan Library, but I don't want it to go to one library. Um, I met with Alan Weinstein at the National Archives, and I've also met with the director of the Library of Congress. Because, see, the collection goes into categories. Like, I have every White House wedding invitation, going back to Dolly Madison. Not only the w weddings, but when the president got married. Um, then I have menus from the presidential yachts and trains. So I want it to be a learning tool. And um, my brother passed away last November, and, and all of a sudden I realized none of us are here forever. So the one thing I'm most concerned with is where my collection goes, because it's it's phenomenal collection. I'm not concerned with my art or anything, but the collection is, is so we could talk about it. Okay. <laughs> about uh, the ties. No, yeah. the ties off limits. The ties off. Uh, Annie has. It. How can you say no to the first lady? Shame on you. That's really an honor. <laughs> I'm Annie Abrams, and I'm a collector. And one of the things that they always say, I'm almost the bag lady that's picking up everything when I go to anything that I think has historical significance. How do you protect and what is the value of your collection? Lords of England, who is your insurer? <laughs> Someone asked me a few months ago, what was my greatest treasure? And I said, my nephew, my family. And I mean that. I never looked for value. Um, you know, when the president would play heart, President Clinton would play hearts on Air Force One, I would want the score sheet or something like that. I wanted the quirky things. I wanted things that tell the story. If I had been um, one of these people that was looking for value, I would have collected letters from Jefferson and Jackson. I do have a wonderful uh, menu from Andrew Jackson. Do you know the expression, um, okay, get the okay? Do you know where it came about? Martin Van Buren, President Van Buren, was from Kinderhook, New York. How's my accent? New York? Yeah. And Andrew Jackson used to call him Old Kinderhook, because that's where he was from, Kinderhook, New York. So he would say, referring to Martin Van Buren, get the OK, and then he would write OK. So I had this great menu with an OK for Martin Van Buren. So I love, the, again, the things that tell the story, the little quirky things. I'm not looking for value. And um, it's really, again, getting back to Arthur Schlesinger, he said that my collection uh, provides the threads, the connecting threads of the presidency. And that's what I love about it. I, I'm not interested in the value. You'd be more valued to me. I have a question right here. I don't, I couldn't hear you. Do you have a title for your second book? I do. It's called The President's Inauguration, An American Pageant. And by the way, when we're done, because I know there's a limit, I have plenty of little things that, that, that my new best friend in St. Louis, Mrs. Pulitzer, gave me. I'll be happy to share them with you if you want to see some of them. Anybody afterwards? Somebody must have more questions. Any question right here? Here's a Lady in the blue sweater. Right. I have a very profound question. What kind of dogs do you have now? 
<laughs> I don't have a dog right now. I was over at the State House, and I do know that the curator has Basset Hounds, another one has Yellow Labs, and I think um, you have a German Shepherd? Mosley or something? Yeah, I mean, I, I've got to get, got to meet him. I'm available. <laughs> um, Mrs. Reagan, I, of course I can't repeat what she said, but when Mrs. Reagan gave me a little book party at, at the Reagan Library, and Skip's getting very nervous now, I'm not gonna tell you what, what I said and what she said, but yeah, part of it. If you do, it's off limits. Right, but anyway, um, Frank Sin I had many friends in the entertainment business who gave me their collections, and Frank Sinatra was one of them. And um, I have this menu when uh, Mr. Sinatra escorted Greta Garbo to one of Franklin Roosevelt's birthday balls. And on the back of it, he just wrote a little personal memoir. How's that? Memoir. Well, when I went to the party, Mrs. Reagan was standing around with all her chief of staff and her handlers. And she said, Barry, she says, what did Francis Albert write on the back of the menu? I said, Nancy, I said, how shall I tell it to you? She said, straight. She said, oh my. <laughs> but you know, speaking about- Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Got one right behind you, Bob. I was okay, Skip. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, a few months back in the issue of Vanity Fair, there's a really interesting article about entertaining in D.C. And it kind of pointed out that like back in the days of, the, of Ken the Kennedys, kind of the point was to invite interesting people and put them together and see what would happen. It was more of a fun kind of thing to today, where it seems that the point of entertaining is more either fundraising or lobbying. I was wondering if, if you've seen that same kind of change. Well, actually, I've seen... Um I'm going to back into this, is um, Henry Kissinger told me that when he was a Harvard professor, one of his students, excuse me, I got that reversed, he was a student with Arthur Schlesinger, and Arthur Schlesinger used to invite him to the Kennedy White House just to meet all the interesting people. I think one of the, the tremendous successes and the many successes of President and Mrs. Clinton is they knew how to mix up people. You know, people think sophistication is putting on a tuxedo or white tie and tails, but sophistication is mixing all kinds of people and knowing how to mix them and learning. Um, I remember one of these parties, I, I caught the president's mother, Virginia Kelly, winking at one of the Marine guards. And I said, Virginia, were you winking at that officer? She says, oh, Barry, I wouldn't do that. I was winking back. <laughs> one, que one more question, because we're at the back, we're right here, that's okay, they should right, right, right there, and then, then we've got to start the book signing. Have you thought about doing a book on these antidotes? That's going to be book four. <laughs> That's book four. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Barry Landau. Thank you.